We have a lot to do this evening, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I would remind anybody who wants to speak or just to register in favor or in opposition to anything, please uh, get a little green sheet of paper over there and fill out your name. And if you'd like to speak in favor or against or register in favor or against to speak for informational purposes only, or if you have a citizen's comment, we'd appreciate it if you'd fill out the form. Uh, the first uh, item is to call to order the regular meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville on Tuesday, March 11th at 7 o'clock p.m. We'll start with roll call. Eileen Nichols. Here. Patrice Stanner. Here. Mike Den. Here. Barbara Doss. Here. Barbara Stockhausen. Here. Dick Bonin. Here. And Ken Killian. Here. First item on our agenda this evening is a public hearing, Ordinance 1403, the Zoning Code Amendments, and we'll start with staff presentation. Okay, staff is proposing uh, several changes to the zoning ordinance uh, to make changes that would uh, impact the maximum allowable building height for uh, most of the districts and uh, the minimum setback for several of the districts in, in the ordinance. Um, this came about, I guess, for a couple reasons. Uh, the main one where I first uh, kind of made a note to look at this change at some point was um, what I would consider conflicts with our design standards for multifamily and commercial development. Uh, there's several sections in the standards that really put an emphasis on providing an interest in some variation in uh, the roof lines of buildings to break up any you know, long, monotonous uh, building uh, appearance. So to really do that, uh, it kind of forces uh, the designers to put um, some variation in the buildings, which in a lot of cases requires them to go higher to meet the ordinance standards as far as the design appearance. So that, in many cases, causes a conflict with the maximum building height that is required in a different part of our ordinance. So to overcome that, I've, I've made a proposal to increase the, the allowable building height in several of those districts. Um, there's some other instances that came up, not quite as common, but um, some variances, requests that have been uh, requested over the years regarding the, the allowable building height. Um, and then I, as I was looking at it, you know, there were some areas where I thought some of the manufacturing districts, even though the uses are very similar, the allowable height are different, and same with commercial and residential districts have a similar kind of a thing. So I was trying to get some consistency in some of those standards as well. So. Um, what I'm proposing, and I've got the ordinance in your packet, is to increase the, the allowable building height for uh, all the districts except two. In most cases, it's adding an additional five feet or ten feet to the, uh, the allowable height. Um, the exception to that would be the recommendation for the B2 Central Business District. That is from 50, recommended from 50 feet to 70 feet, and that number came from the downtown revitalization plan. Um, so that does have a little bit higher increase. Um, a similar situation with the minimum setbacks. It came out primarily with, again, with the design standards. That The standards really put an emphasis on putting parking to the side and the rear of the building. But they, it allows the, the ordinance allows the parking to be right up to the lot line. But it requires the building to be set back quite a distance. In particular, the, the B3 highway business uh, from the the front property line, it requires the building to be back 50 feet, so it almost forces the designer or the architect to put the parking in front of the building, which is contrary to what the design standards uh, call for. Um, so I uh, made a recommendation to in decrease that significantly and bring it in line with the other commercial districts as far as the setbacks. Um, so the actual changes in your packet, we've talked about it previously. Um, this did go to the plan commission actually at a couple different meetings. They reviewed it and they have recommended approval of the changes mm -hmm. that have been presented. Um, one additional item of uh, information that's in your packet from last time, um, Ken had requested some um, just building heights for buildings in the downtown just to give some comparison so we know what, what do we have downtown now and how does that compare with the, the ordinance and what's proposed. So. I just went up and down Main Street and grabbed a, a variety of buildings um, starting at the top of Main and working my way down. And then I pulled a, a few of them off that you can see from Middle Street and then on the other side from Pine Street. Uh, so I got some back of those buildings as well. So it just gives you a better feel for what the, 
the existing situation is downtown. Um, but not surprisingly, the, the tallest building in the downtown area is Jenner Towers, which does have a height on that lower end of about 68 feet. Uh, most of the buildings are in the 40 to 50 foot range, um, somewhere in that vicinity. So that is additional information. Um, otherwise, I, staff does recommend approval of the changes. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, Joe, it, when you measure the height of a building, if a new building is built, is the measurement taken from the lowest uh, point on the lot or from the highest point on the lot? Um, I mean, if <coughs> I'm going to talk about a 70-foot building, am I talking about a 70-foot building that starts on the downhill and goes 70 feet, or am I talking on, because we have several large hills in Platteville, so it makes it a big difference if I'm talking about 70 feet from the top of the hill, and then it still goes farther down. It could be over, I don't know, 90 feet then if you measure. So I need to know where you're measuring from. The, the building height would be measured from the street facade, and if you have a, a sloping site, we would try to get an average from the, the highest to the lowest and get the midpoint in there for, for the zoning purposes. A, as far as where we measure from, as far as the ground, as far as the maximum height, the, the, the ordinance, it depends on the roof style. For the buildings downtown where you've got a, a flat roof with a flat parapet, it's going to be the top of that parapet. If you've got a you know a, a gable roof, it would be, again, it, essentially it's the average, uh, the midpoint between the peak and the, the eaves is and, where the And I'm not so worried about that as I am about the fall of the land. Right. So because most of the buildings on Main Street, you know, the, the street would be fairly level in the front, but, for instance, I've got, you know, the measurement for this building, and it varies um, along 4th Street quite a bit. And that's a combination of the, you know, Fourth Street slopes down, and the building also gets taller where the auditorium is. So the, that's the question: Is so, this a 33-foot building or a 50-foot building? Um, that would be. We would have to, it, from a zoning standpoint, if we were coming in to figure out the height, we'd have to take an average of that. Interesting. Other questions? I think due to the fact that we have a lot to cover tonight, I think we should go with our staff, their experience, people, know what they're doing, so I think we should go that route. Well, we have a <clears throat> bunch of other um, sections we have to go through, so if there are no other questions from staff, I'm going to ask for any public statements in favor. Don't have anyone who's registered, but if anybody wanted to speak on this issue, uh, public statements against, public statements in general. Any further council discussion? That'll be my point there. <laughs> I went out of turn, I think. Well, uh, I I would just say that I'm very uncomfortable with the with the way the fall of the land is here measuring and having buildings that now may exceed 100 feet with averaging. I would like to see that at 60 feet. <clears throat> I can deal with 60 feet, but I don't, per I don't like the 70 foot on that one particular issue. So you're more, Mike, are you saying you would like to change or alter the um, central business district from 70 to 60 feet? Correct. Are you making, I mean, is there a, right. is that an amendment? Well, we have to close the public hearing before we can do a motion, but if but that's okay. your that's your suggestion then to change it from 70 feet in the central business district to 60. Um, looking at the <coughs> other buildings that were measured, the the um, Steve's Pizza is 55 feet tall, and Jenner Towers, if you're at the northeast corner, is 68 feet tall. So. Going six and then it's 60 from Oak Street on Oak Street on the northwest corner. So 60 feet seems to be right now, at least between 55 and 60, is the largest or the tallest building that we have in the central business district. So, any other council discussion? Otherwise, I would need a motion to close the public hearing. Other Move than to close I, the public hearing. 
I just have one quick comment. I think it makes more sense to build up than build out. So I would um, agree to the 70 foot maximum. Okay. So we have a, go ahead, Ken. You have a motion to close I the move public? to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion in a second and we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Steckhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Common Council action. I would make a motion to um, go with the, the um, recommendation by city staff. Second. So to approve ordinance 1403, zoning code amendments? Yes. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're gonna we'd well, like to make a mo amendment to the motion. All right. I'd like to amend that to 60 feet, not 70 feet on that particular height In restriction. It. Central business. It's not Central an amendment. Business. That's something different. She's already made a motion for 70 this feet. Is, but I can amend that motion. You can, can amend, amend, amend it. He's, am he's asking to amend the motion to 60 feet in the Central Business District, district, I believe correct. it was called. <clears throat> is there a second to that? I'll second the motion. All right. We have a motion and a second on an amendment to change it from 70 feet to 60 feet. And I agree with that uh, amendment because 70 feet is too high for the central business district area the buildings would look out of place if they were that tall we put them on main streets so i agree with it we'll vote on the amendment first nichols yes steiner no den yes das yes stackhausen no bonin no killian yes motion carries now we'll vote on the motion Nichols? Yes. Steiner? That's a, we're voting on my motion? Yes, we're voting on your motion to approve it, but it's been amended. Oh, yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right, next is consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature or previous discussion. Please indicate to the council president if you would prefer separate discussion and action. Item A is minutes of the February 25th, 2014 regular council meeting. B is payment of bills. C is financial report for February. D is appointments to boards and commissions. And the appointments this evening are for the Board of Appeals zoning as an alternate for a three year term, Tom Lindahl and Board of Review, a five-year term for Tor Troy McGee, and uh, Board of Review for a five-year term, John Ernest. Licenses, one or two-year operator's licenses, which were in our packet. Resolution 1406 regarding the sale of industry park land to J TJT Properties, LLC. Resolution 1407 recognizing Dan Thompson, Executive Director of the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, and Resolution 1411, which is authorizing the submission of an application for fiscal year 2014 Economic Development Assistant Programs grant funds to the EDA for investments for public works and economic development facilities. Is there make, a motion? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, or consent calendar, pardon me. Second. I have a motion and a second. And we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Next is citizens' comments, observations, and petitions. And we do ask that you limit your comments to no more than five minutes. Um, the first is Dan Winch on snow removal. Then Patrick Ahern on crosswalk signal and Arlene Sis on historic expo. So if you will come up to the microphone over here, please. And give your name and address. My name is Dan Winch and I live at 345 Bailey Avenue. Platform, obviously. I might actually just start this by asking, um, what do you any one of you see as <clears throat> the use case for the sidewalks, as in how do you anticipate people using the sidewalks? 
I'm sorry, this is not for discussion, so just go ahead and give your, okay. your comments. Please. Well, I anticipate people would use the sidewalks to not only go around a block, but also to cross the streets to continue to actually go to locations. And I believe that's how the majority of people use it. They don't sit around, go around circles in the blocks. So that being said, um, I would anticipate that the roads would be a good indication as to uh, how clean the sidewalk should be. Because if the people are crossing the street, it should be just as safe for them to cross the street as it is for them to be on the, on the sidewalk. And here, I'm going to pass this down. Pass that, please. That is a picture of the street 36 hours after uh, snow has been removed, after, after an accumulation, if you will, has, a, has occurred. <clears throat> now I'm going to turn to what the ordinance says. Uh, no owner of land within the city of Platteville shall allow accumulations of snow or ice on pu any public sidewalk within the city for more than 36 hours. We'll note here that the cause of said accumulation is not noted. It further says the actual cost of such snow removal shall be charged the, against the property owner. It does not specify a price. Examining this ordinance, we understand that should any accumulation exist on the, pro on the sidewalk for any reason, the city shall, city shall have the right to remove it. This means that if a single ounce of snow is missed, on the, any part of the sidewalk, it qualifies. If the sidewalk is completely devoid of snow after a snowfall, but a child places a snowball on the sidewalk for 36 hours, this qualifies. With no set price, the city now has free reign to steal from said landowner whatever dollar amount it so desires. In the words of Howie Crowfoot, that is simply the cost. But the city will be reasonable, right? Enter exhibit number two. This is my sidewalk, supposedly 36 hours after a snowfall. Now we'll see that there is a little bit of snow there. But it is less than the amount of snow that was on the, on the street. <clears throat> uh, knowing that, that uh, the use case for the sidewalk includes the use of the street, it is reasonable to estimate that the use of the street is not, since the use of the street is not devoid of every single ounce of snow, then the sidewalk need not be devoid either. Uh, to my neighbor and me, the sidewalk, as it is shown there, is clear based on this reasonable use case. To compare this to other cities, we see that Eau Claire, with 195 miles of streets significantly larger than Platteville, does not even begin snow removal until at least three inches of snow has accumulated. Again, the ordinance does not guide the property owner on the amount of allowable snow. So in my opinion, or so, so the opinion rather of any city official is simply a subjective opinion, not backed up by a quantitative provable law. Yet, here is the bill that I received uh, for $50 without any kind of warning, without any letter of intent to say that they are going to come remove the snow, and without any kind of contract. This now creates a dilemma for any property owners in the city of Platteville, because should a single ounce of snow remain on any sidewalk, the city may charge an infinite number of dollars uh, for the removal. This now makes the property not an investment, but a liability. For who in their right mind would want to have such a liability? It makes all property in the city of Platteville worth exactly nothing, because no one would purchase such a liability. But wait, this seems unfair. Let's examine the appeal process. Here in the United States, we have three branches of government. Uh, we have the branch called the judicial branch, which oversees legislators to ensure that tyranny not exist. Surely, this would, uh, they would see that the taking from the individual for the benefit of the common good has a term. How do we appeal this decision? It gets appealed to the city council, the very same group that wrote the law. Now the legislators writing the law are overseeing themselves. This, ladies and gentlemen, breaks the system that our country was founded on and is unconstitutional. You have deemed yourselves dictators capable of charging an infinite number of dollars to any of your constituents unexpectedly for the betterment of the common good and the jollies of the bully Howie Crowfoot. This is communism at its finest. I'd like to see each and every one of you sit down with those injured in battle against communism and grieving friends and relatives who lost in, uh, individuals in such wars and explain to them exactly why you feel their sacrifice was so insignificant. Mr. Winch, your five minutes is up, so... 
<clears throat> if you would just make your final statement, please. My final statement is I would, I would ask that three things occur here. One, you dismiss the charge against me. Two, oh, and my neighbor, I should add, since he's in the same situation as I am. Two, you change the law. And three, effective immediately remove Howie Crowfoot, who is under his supervision, has been, this law has continued. Should this matter go to a class action lawsuit, any lawyer worth his salt would not only ask for this, but for the retroactive repayment from by the city of its fine constituents since the law has been, was enacted, plus interest due to its constituents in the amount of 1% per month as it is stated in the, in the law. Further, punitive damages against the city would be sought to ensure that this type of behavior not continue. Thank you. May I have some kind of... No. Thank you. May I have some kind of action on this, please? No, not tonight. Thank you, Mr. Winch. We will take note of your request. All right, the next person that is asked to speak is um, Patrick Ahern regarding the crosswalk how, signal. How might I expect to We will be talking with the city manager. Thank you. And again, five minutes, please, no longer. Right. And your name and your address? Um, Patrick Ahern, 60 South College Drive. Okay. All right, um, I am representing the Institute of Transportation Engineers from UW Platteville, and uh, we are looking to enter into a competition to win a free solar powered crosswalk beacon. Um, the prize, uh, well, first off, the competition. Uh, it is where uh, universities can enter and uh, collect Facebook likes, whichever university, or uh, the top three universities to collect the most Facebook likes will be uh, put into review, and then they'll choose the, uh, one of the top three to receive a free solar crosswalk beacon. Um, the installation costs would not be covered by the competition, but I have talked with uh, the campus and the facilities management has agreed to cover the cost of the installation of the sign. So it'd be for, uh, no cost at all to the city uh, for the sign. Um, our proposed location would be across Southwest uh, Road at the intersection of Marquis Avenue and Southwest Road. Um, right now, this is just a recommendation and uh, we'll take further consideration if we were to win the sign. And uh, I could return if you would like me to, uh, to discuss that. Um, the reason why we took, th we. Uh, picked that location was that there's roughly uh, 1,200 pedestrians that use that crosswalk daily on a school day. Uh, this is because uh, Roundtree uh, Residence Hall is on the other side of that, and uh, they have to cross that uh, crosswalk to get to campus. Uh, so with that, I will uh, yield to questions at all. Have you spoken to Mr. Crowfoot about this? Yes. Okay. Um, Right now, just thank you for the information. Mm -hmm. We're just going to uh, let you work with Mr. Profit. All right, thank you. Uh, Arlene Sis, Historic Expo. Arlene Sis, 130 North Hickory Street. Um, I wanna thank not only the, the people who are gathered here, but everyone who per, uh, supported the Historic Preservation Commission, um, his uh, historic uh, weekend that we had here in Platteville. It was a wonderful success. We had a great dinner. We had wonderful speakers. And, um, and then we ended the weekend going down to the uh, Badger Bar and everybody had a wonderful time and heard a lot of history about Platteville and all the things that we have done in our past. And I wanted to thank everybody for their support and participation in this wonderful event. Thank you so much. Thank you. On to reports. Committee reports in our packet included Commission on Aging Bonin. Anything I have none to add. Nothing to add? All right. Historic Preservation Commission, Killian. I would like to say uh, that uh, the event, Historic Echo, was very successful, and I extend my sincere thanks to Joe Carroll and Howard Crowfoot and Luke uh, Peters for their help with the expo and anybody else that I missed uh, from the list. So thank you very much, 
as far as the staff and also the, the input from the public. Thank you. Eileen, I did miss. Okay. We all sh should have got this. Everyone needs three to come from Connie, and mm -hmm. she's not here tonight. Right. So it's just an add-on to what you do have. It was has, a memo from Connie Steinhoff that everyone received. Has okay. to do with the Sunday cab. Right. Okay. Museum board, Stockhausen. Nothing <coughs> to change. Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, Killian. No addition. Redevelopment Authority, Dawes. Nothing. Other reports in the packet, airport financial report for February, city attorney itemized statement, water sewer revenue and expenditures for February, and department progress reports. Any questions or comments on any of those? All right, hearing none, we'll go on to the first action item, which is an amendment to the rental inspection contract with MV Services. Joe? Okay, as we talked about previously, uh, we're making a proposal to change the uh, rental inspection fee schedule as well as the uh, licensing fee schedule. Um, they, they both go together, um, but they require two amendments. Uh, the first one is the amendment to the contract with MV Services. They're the firm that provides the rental inspections for the city. And then the follow-up item will be a resolution to amend the fee schedule. <coughs> but the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the goal of both of those changes is to develop a schedule that um, basically recognizes the amount of time that it takes to conduct the inspections and to uh, operate the rental program for the city and have the, the fees um, basically recognize that. So the, uh, the, the units that provide less time effort on behalf of the city and the, the, the inspector um, should be charged a, a lower fee. And of course, finally, MV services would be paid a, a lesser fee to conduct those inspections. And those units that require a lot more time and effort would uh, also pay a higher fee to cover the uh, additional time and effort. Um, so I did make a proposal to change both of those. Um, they do have followed the same general structure. Basically, MV services would get paid uh, $12 less for each type of unit compared to what the um, property owner would pay for the license itself. And that additional fee, that difference is critical because it covers not only what MV services gets paid, but also to recognize the amount of time that staff has uh, or spends uh, in operating the program. So the end result is, you know, it's obviously based on some assumptions as far as uh, how much time we usually spend, but the intent that the program essentially would pay for itself um, so it wouldn't be in incorporate any tax dollars into it. Um, MV Services has agreed to um, the changes to their uh, contract. Uh, obviously, we have to sign the, the amendment, but they have seen the proposal and they are in agreement with that. So. Um, I think the only question that we would need to resolve for both of those, since they really do have to go together, is to come up with a, a start date for both what the property owner would pay and what MB would be paid so that we, they go together. So that would be something we should put into the contract itself. Other than that, staff does recommend approval of the contract amendment as well as the fee schedule change. Any questions? <coughs> Joe, how far out do you, um, are property owners notified that it's time for a rental inspection? Uh, we send out a notification postcard uh, approximately 90 days before the, the due date of when their license expires, um, give or take a little bit, and then uh, they would have to set up an, a, an appointment with MV to actually conduct the inspection. So usually the inspection is, you know, going to be done you know, 30 days or more prior to that expiration date. Um, occasionally we do have, if they have additional work that needs to be done, that it might actually go past the expiration date, but we usually try to get them completed before that expiration date. So my question is, July 1, a reasonable date for implementation? Um, I, I guess I didn't really have a date in mind, but I, I'm a little concerned about going too far out because we're going to have some property owners that, if it benefits them, then they're going <laughs> to they're going to delay the inspections, and we're going to have this lull in activity. Um, so I, I would say something shorter than that, uh, 30 to 60 days, I guess, is what I had in mind. Oh. June, 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 June one, you think? Also, oh, did June one, you're saying? 
Good May first. <coughs> May first is less than sixty days. Yeah. Uh, I would. I. I think we could work with May first. May first. Yeah. So those in, uh, some landlords would have received notification already about the need for an inspection. So you're saying that that inspection, if it's completed after May first, then the, uh, the new the fees would. <coughs> the last cards I just sent out um, last week were for units that expire in June and July, and August. <laughs> Okay, Carol sent a few more that were on the sheet than I intended, but <laughs> the intent was through the end of July, so. But they haven't conducted those inspections yet, obviously, so. So, Joe, is there a reason we can't make it immediate? Um, no, I guess the only question would be the, the units that they, they've conducted the first inspection, and they have to go back and do a follow-up inspection. There, there's kind of the assumption under the, the existing rules that there, there isn't a, a fee for that additional follow-up inspection, but with the, the new rules that it would be different. So I, I would like a little bit of time to just clear whatever paperwork is kind of underway now so that when MV services shows up to do an inspection, they can say, here's what the fee schedule that applies to this inspection. So everybody's clear on exactly what's going to be paid. So we're back to May 1 then. Or April 1. Well, April 1 isn't that far away. May 1, we thought, right, Joe? Did you say you could uh, live with May the, 1? The main thing I'm concerned about is that everybody is in agreement as to when this goes into effect. It affects you more than us. May 1. I, I'd say May 1. Did you need a motion? It's just bravo. Well, we would need a motion to relative to the <coughs> rental inspection contract and the date would be added then, I believe is what you're requesting. Yes. right. Any other questions on the contract itself? Uh, again, I would like to see this contract reviewed after a, a year. I mean, we've been under this same contract since, <coughs> I can't even remember if the original contract was in 2006 or if it was before. I think it was 2006. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, a motion would be in order. I'd make a motion to adopt the second amendment to the rental inspection contract mm -hmm. with a uh, date uh, of May 1, 2014, and the expectation of a review of this contract during the first quarter of 2015. A second. I have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is Resolution 1408 to amend the 2014 fee schedule for rental license fees. And Joe? Uh, yeah, this goes along with that. This would be the fee schedule um, that uh, the property owner, the uh, landlord, would actually pay to obtain that license. As I mentioned, it, it corresponds with the, the fee schedule that MV gets paid. It's just $12 more per unit, essentially. So that staff does recommend approval. And I would say that it's, it's got the same date then. Well, I make a motion to um, approve resolution 1408 to amend the 2014 fee schedule regarding rental license fees. With a date to begin May 1st. To begin May 1. Second to the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is resolution 1409, expanding the assigned parking lot number eight. It would be at 4th and Furnace Street. And Larry? Certainly. Uh, <clears throat> On January 16th, the City of Platteville completed the purchase of the parking lot on the corner of 4th and Furnace Street. Uh, at our last council meeting, we discussed briefly uh, what we intended to do with that parking lot, and I was instructed to draft a resolution that would uh, place those parking spaces into the assigned parking program. Um, enclosed is a copy of the resolution, 14-09, that uh, establishes lot number eight in the city's parking 
uh, of the city's parking lot, and it puts lot number eight, all 18 parking spaces, into the assigned parking program. Does anyone have any questions? Well, I guess my only comment is do we really need 18 because we still have 10 available of the 20 uh, total of the city has. So uh, at the last meeting, I had recommended, uh, I guess, compromising. There are some city employees who uh, like the idea of parking in the parking lot um, during the day. So I would recommend dividing it uh, nine uh, designated for city employees and nine open for assigned parking. Other comments? You're, you're comparing to um, Roundtree Avenue, which has, uh, what, 12 spaces and three are assigned right now? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I yeah. believe there are, t are there 10 yeah. spaces. But the thing well. about it is, is that the Roundtree Avenue uh, lot does not have the good location as compared to what this one does. Mm -hmm. Well, this would open up nine spaces. One thing about it with the Roundtree, that came at mid-semester. This is going to be... Reserve would would possibly be reserved parking starting beginning of the the school year, which therefore I I believe that we won't have a problem uh, leasing all these parking stalls. It won't come in midterm like the Roundtree did. Any other comments? Otherwise, a motion would be in order. I make a motion we adopt resolution 1409, expanding the assigned parking locations within the city of Platteville. Second to the motion. I have a motion in the second. You're talking all 18 spaces, Barb? Yep. Mm -hmm. As written. Okay. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? No. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is contract 114 Broadway reconstruction. Okay. We've uh, talked about this at the last meeting. Uh, we've had bids for the Broadway uh, reconstruction. And what it seems is though uh, a general consensus of the council is that we would do the base bid, which would be uh, the street in concrete, along with alternate A, Grant Street, water sewer, and street reconstruction. Uh, the other thing that came up was uh, we, we determined that alternate D, the bike path, for uh, $15,163 could be done using park impact fees, so that would not, that would not, uh, um, that would not change what we do regarding the rest of the contract, whether you include that or not. Um, so, what we've done is in the report, I've included the cost for the engineering, and what we find is if we do the base bid and alternate A, the city would need to overcome a deficit of $374,072.95. Utility would have a deficit. Uh, of 35,159.25. Yesterday, the Water and Sewer Commission uh, recommended approval to include alternate A, and they would uh, take it from their fund balance. Uh, so they they have already identified that if the Common Council agrees to doing alternate A, Water and Sewer also agrees with alternate A, and and they have determined how they are going to take care of their deficit. Um, so based on what we have here is we have, uh, we're recommending the award contract 1-14 to McGuire uh, for the base bid with alternate A, which is the Grant Street reconstruction, and alternate D, which is the bike path reconstruction. That total is $2,418,807.95. And of the deficit, 15163 would be from park impact fees for the alternate D bike path. That, that leaves that 
$74,000 left to uh, cover. Uh, we have up to 165000 that we feel could come from other CIP accounts, uh, which would leave 209000 for uh, either the fund balance or borrowing, or the city could uh, uh, use fund balance or borrowing for as much as the total 374000 We have uh, uh, Dan Dressen from Delta Three Engineering here to answer any questions that you may have. And we also have uh, representatives from both the uh, concrete and the asphalt industry. If you have any questions of them at this time, uh, I believe that we had some input from them at the uh, last meeting. But if you have any other questions specifically for them, the representatives are here. At this time, Howard, I'd like to make a resolution that we accept the base bid with alternate 1-14-F, the asphalt paving, because you're looking at a considerable amount of savings here, and at this point in time, you're talking about borrowing a whole lot more money than we had budgeted for this project, and I don't think it's a good way to go about it, because some of those projects you talked about, uh, finding that hundred and some thousand dollars, <coughs> part of it's taking away from street repair. and that's the last thing we need to do. So I'm making a resolution that we accept this alternate F. Okay, so Mike, a resolution is not the same as a motion and we do have That's two me. people. I made a mistake and I want to make a motion at this okay, point. Okay, um, we do have two people who would like to speak as well, I so. I still like to have my motion. Okay, if you want to make the motion, go ahead and then I think I will allow these two individuals to speak. We would like to make to the speak. motion that we accept alternate <coughs> F, 114F for asphalt. And that includes alternate? The base bid plus this, with this alternate. Okay, so the base is, okay. Just the base bid. Okay, is there a second to that motion? I, I would like to hear what the other contractors and engineers have to say. All right, I do not hear a second at this time, so I will uh, note that there are two individuals who have asked to speak for informational purposes only, um, Jim Rosemeyer and Don Iverson. So if you will come up to the microphone, please, and give your name and address. I'm uh, Jim Rosemeyer from uh, 1275 North 4th in Platteville. And I had the opportunity to talk to everybody but Patrice, I think, this last week and just give uh, some input that uh, I felt wasn't, that wasn't maybe uh, uh, needed. Um, and some of the th things that I heard from the U.S. Council members were uh, really important issues. Um, uh, someone mentioned the $182,000 that was, would be saved by going to asphalt. Um, Ken, you mentioned uh, the problem possibly with bridging um, uh, asphalt versus concrete, and maybe one would be better than the other. Um, I think even Dick mentioned the thickness of the of the concrete was important to you and 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 th that ability and and someone had mentioned also that since we started in concrete, we should continue in concrete. You know, um, many of you talked about the base. You know how important the base is, and uh, temperature changes in Wisconsin how it affects it, and the green part of maybe asphalt being more green than than uh, able to you know recycle instead of the uh, concrete and also ease of repair one versus the other you also brought up the Lancaster to Platteville portion of, of the highway and what the problems are there I've heard sense about the Walmart um, uh, asphalt out there and what happened with that um, and also just Platteville streets you know driving through Platteville streets and the problems with some of the streets and if it's, it should be asphalt or concrete. Having said all of that, <clears throat> we have an expert here tonight who has no horse in the race. We have Matthew who wants asphalt. We have Bard who wants concrete. I'm here because I may have a quarry that has, that profits from the asphalt. We have Don Iverson here who's been in the business for 45, I don't want to age him, we'll say over 25 years, who has no 
dog in this race. He sells aggregate for asphalt and concrete. He's done more projects over the last 30, 40 years than you can imagine and understands what base means, what temperature means, what load means more than all of us put together. So I'm acting kind of as a prelude to him, and he's probably pretty embarrassed about it, but I'm not the expert, neither any of you, and, and he probably is. So I encourage you to ask him questions about the things we just talked about so that you can all maybe know more than you did before the meeting started. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I'm no expert, but I've been around a little bit. But, Could you uh, give your name, please, just for a uh, Don Iverson. <clears throat> I uh, sold out to Matthew about 20-some years ago, and I was in the asphalt business. Uh, so I'm not promoting asphalt or concrete here. I, I'm still in the crushing business, and I do, uh, I sell to concrete people and asphalt people. But I'll tell you one thing about this area, where we have a, a clay sub-base, we have a, a temperature change of 150 degrees here, and so we need a flexible pavement. And if there's, I, I can tell you the cost to replace uh, patches on concrete, it's more expensive. and. Blacktop, they'll say it doesn't last as long, but it's easy to recycle. It's not easy to recycle concrete. And I'm just stressing that I don't have an agenda. And, but you need, you need a flexible pavement in this area. You get down south where you don't have the big things. You, it, you brought up the, the uh, Lancaster Highway. That was done with, uh, it's called, uh, years ago, matter of fact, that was part of it. We went in and mixed up the uh, base course up and added cement to it, and it's called soil cement. The, the cause of that out there right now, it has nothing to do with the blacktop. It has to do with the big chunks of soil cement that are raising up and down. From Platteville to Cuba City, that was concrete. I had the first job letting this state where we had to go in and break up the concrete and then overlay it with blacktop. We broke it down to chunks of 18 inches or less. And you don't have the problem down there. You go from Montfort to Dodgeville, that was a soil cement job, never done. It was never never broken up or anything. I paved that twice. Matthew's paved it twice in 40 years, mm -hmm. and they still have the problem. So where you have a big temperature change like we have now, it, it doesn't pay. You, you go in and cut, uh, you got water mains going in. You go in and cut that, I'll guarantee it's gonna cost you more to fix that than it will with blacktop. And I, I'm not promoting blacktop, but you need flexible pavement in this area. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have representatives here also from the concrete um, contractors. If you'd like to speak at this time, you certainly may. <clears throat> Give your name, please, for our record purposes. Sure. My name is Heath Schaff. I'm with the Wisconsin Concrete Pavement Association, and I'm a professional engineer in the state of Wisconsin, hired by the Paving Association to promote concrete pavements. And I guess if you all have any questions for me, I just thought I'd drive down here to Platteville tonight, listen to your conversations, and answer any questions. I think you guys all understand the economics behind the decision. You have one pavement that has a lower initial cost, 
another pavement type that's going to reduce the amount of maintenance, possibly future costs. Um, life cycle cost analysis is an economic engineering tool used to weigh two equal alternatives. Uh, your staff has, has done a good job. Delta 3 is here in the room. Um, they're your hired experts. They're your engineers. They're your staff. And I would say I would recommend trusting their judgment. They don't have any skin in the game. And I can stand up here and give you all the pros about concrete. Um, I disagree with several of the comments made by the gentleman before me. Um, you know, I don't see any engineering sound judgment behind those comments. Um, so... If you have any questions, feel free to, to ask away. What about uh, recycling? <clears throat> this publication that they gave us uh, says that concrete is 100% recyclable. Mm -hmm. It could be used as a base for new payment, used as aggregate and new concrete payment, steel removed and recycled. So what yeah, do you I, know I, about recycling? Re what recycling? About recycling, asphalt? recycling from a, a pavement standpoint, I, I'm with the concrete industry. Um, you know, and, and we both, our concrete industry and the asphalt industry, if you look at the state of Wisconsin and the Department of Transportation, they are the biggest recycler of any of us, okay? We recycle 100% of the asphalt pavements out there. We recycle 100% of the concrete pavements out there. One's not recycling more than the other, all right? Um, they pick theirs up a lot more than we do, okay? And have to recycle it more but it's usually a thicker volume. Our volume is a greater volume when we have to pick it up. We still run it through our crushers, we crush it back and we use it for base course. It's not like when our pavements have reached their useful life, we put them in a landfill. That's not the case. There are concretes that are crushed and used. Aggregates are used for concrete pavements. Aggregates are used for base course. Um, we recycle 100% of the concrete pavement. The only thing with your concrete is that you, you can recycle it for a base, but you can't recycle it to produce a new road. As far as this, you have to pour a new concrete. Blacktop, you can reuse and recycle blacktop and make it the top surface, correct? No, we, we use concrete. There's, it's allowed by standard specifications to allow crushed concrete as long as it meets certain aggregate criteria and gradations as aggregate into the new concrete. Very similar are using your recycled asphalt, and if you want the asphalt guys to come up here and tell you that too, they pick it up and they plate it back as base, or they can pick it up and run it through their plants and recycle the material that way. So we can use it as base, just like they can use theirs as base, or we can incorporate the aggregate in our uh, new concrete, just like they will incorporate the aggregate and some of the oil content into their product. Do you have a percentage of the uh, old concrete that you can use in your aggregate for the new concrete? Is there a percentage of that you can use versus new? Or is it just you can use it all? You can use it all. Most, most contractors when it comes to controlling um, air entrainment capabilities, mixing, they won't incorporate all of it. Uh, most roadways out there, they're either widening the cross section, they're requiring additional base course. So most of the time, instead of picking it up and trucking it off site, to then truck it back on site as concrete aggregate. It's easier, you're still recycling it to crush it and blade it out and use it as your base. You're still saving that virgin quarry rock that would have been used and trucked in if you didn't recycle it. You know, you're saving that, so it's still recycling. But I mean, when it comes to recycling, I think the roadway industry, whether it's asphalt or concrete, is very conscious of it. Number one, the reason why we do it is because it saves money. Okay, we're saving money so we don't have to bring in virgin aggregates or, you know, same with the, the asphalt industry. So we're all recycling 100% of our pavements. Yes, ma'am. I got a question. Uh, the last gentleman commented on the highways between Platteville, Lancaster, and Cuba City and Platteville. Mm -hmm. um, but on those roadways, you're going to be traveling 55, 60 miles an hour. Sure. On Broadway, you're not going to have those speeds, 25 miles an hour. Does that enter into, say, uh, how long the, the road lasts? Um, yes and no. Basically, when you're looking at a roadway design, your engineers are going to take the soils data that's underneath that roadway, 
and then the traffic data that's going to ride on that roadway okay and the part that damages roadways is the, the percent of trucks over the overall traffic cars have little to no impact on a pavement structure truck traffic has a lot of impact on a pavement structure the more trucks you have the thicker each pavement section needs to be okay so in Platteville's case when they alternate bid a concrete versus an asphalt section they hired their engineers and they did the best job they could to try to come up with what we would consider as engineers equivalent pavement structures okay so that's where you end up with uh, uh, in your case um, an eight inch concrete over six inches of base course versus five and a half inches um, over six uh, of base course as well but then you have a foot of breaker under one and only six inches of breaker under the other but there's the structure of that pavement is determined by the the type and amount of traffic also the the soils underneath it so if you have less traffic you can get away with a thinner pavement essentially for the same life okay so every pavement is designed for a certain life design life so well, there will be truck traffic on sure Broadway. yep and they and I'm certain they took that into account with their, their cross section each pavement structure will will uh, perform you know as design for that that life period um, I mean typically when you get into heavy truck traffic um, you, you'll go into a, a concrete pavement just because it can't handle truck traffic more than others. The other t pavement type, just when it comes out to pure economics, because they need, in order to carry that truck traffic, they need to increase their thickness to a point where they're not economical anymore. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. I, I have a question uh, of our engineer, if that's okay. Oh, we have that's one okay. more person. I, Go can, ahead. Yeah. Just give your name, please. Who you represent? Uh, Jared Bronchuk, Iverson Construction. I'm also a registered engineer in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Concrete's made some good points. Really, the the biggest point that we're looking at is $182,000 savings. That's $15 for every resident. What is that $15 over the next 30, 40 years? And you're talking about borrowing money. <laughs> in order to do more. For the $182,000 savings, you could do alternate A at $172,000. For the same price, for $10,000 less, you're getting more work. So what does it mean to the city? As far as recycling goes, we recycle 20% of what we take off the road goes right back into the mix. We get the aggregate value and we get the oil value. It reduces our oil load by 20%, and gas is three fifty a gallon, diesel's 4 bucks a gallon. Those are all things that you know, cost us money too. So we can reduce that oil in the mix. We can save the city money. I think we can uh, produce a good product for you guys. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Dan. I think we have a question. Yes. I have a, a question about the base. Okay. And. I don't know if I heard this right or not, but it seems to me like what I heard was that the base is the issue between here and Lancaster in terms of how the base was laid with chunks of stuff in it. So oh. tell me about the base, because I think that's the... Okay. Well, first of all, I wasn't aware of how the road between Lancaster and Plava was constructed until tonight, so it put some you know, light on to, to why it's doing what it's doing. Basically, what we're doing is, is is mentioned about soft clays. We have high moisture clays. Um, what we do, and that's why you see a difference in base between the asphalt structure and the concrete structure. Um, I think uh, Heath from mentioned about structural number, and that's what we're trying to do is is make an equivalent number. Underneath the asphalt pavement, we need to put good base underneath it. We've got 12 inches of breaker run, six inches of gravel. And then in areas where it's soft or we don't have trenches already that are gravel, we put geogrid in and that helps basically prevent the loss of some of our brick or run and increases the structure of the, uh, of the pavement. All that's put into, you know, and that's typically what the city of Platteville has seen. And then you put your asphalt pavement on top. Now the concrete pavement, just because it's, a, it's not a flexible pavement, I think that was brought up about being a flexible pavement, the base underneath, you know, basically gives it stability. With the concrete pavement, it's a more rigid pavement. The concrete has a strength already. Um, so therefore, you need less base underneath because 
frankly, the concrete has it. We put the amount of rock underneath the concrete pavement that we do, including geogrid, more or less just to build it. Um, we put six inches of breaker run, four inches of gravel on it, and um, the concrete industry gets irritated with me because we put so much there because we just need to build it. And we'd be able to, be able to drive concrete trucks on top of it because of our clays around this area. It's fine if it's dry, but the minute we get an ounce of rain, it turns to slop, basically. So that's what we're trying to do when we, we talk about base and, and comparable. Now, one of the things that we're doing different, if you're talking about, if you want to talk about some things with concrete pavement, um, Ken, you brought up to me about Bonson Street, about what's different between the concrete pavement now versus what's in front of the city hall on Bonson Street. And part of that is because I don't know what the base is underneath, but one of the things that they've done differently now is besides just advancements in concrete, mixed design, but then also is putting in dowel bars on the joints so the joints don't flex, don't move as much. And that helps with some of the issues that have been hap that have happened in the past. Basically, it keeps the, the, the uh, pavement from moving up and down. And then, of course, you do the crack sealing to prevent stuff from getting into it. But same thing with asphalt pavement. You still got to seal cracks. You still got to do maintenance on it. And I think at the when we had our last council meeting, you can... I mean, I can look at life cycle, life cost cycle analysis, and if I use the, you know, asphalt one, I can make them low, and I can use a concrete one and make them low. And the reality of it is, is it all depends on what you're going to do for maintenance, and that's the decision the city of Platteville has to make. I think it's a valid point to say that the concrete pavement has a less upfront cost, but the amount of maintenance over the course of the years probably is a little bit less in terms of what has to get done compared to asphalt pavement. In order to keep your asphalt pavements, we need to crack seal, we need to, to uh, do seal coats on them, and then eventually mill it off and do overlays. As long as you follow those practices, it'll last as long as concrete, but you have to follow certain things. No different with a concrete pavement, you have to continuously seal the joints every so many years, prevent water and salt getting in dirt and getting into them. When you have a cracked slab, you have to fix it right away so it doesn't get worse. So it's a matter of, and I, it's a matter of trying to figure out what your maintenance program is going to be, and that makes a decision on which pavement you go with. Both can be great for the city of Platteville. It's just, how are you going to take care of them? Do you have a rough idea what the cost per square foot is on the, what you call that, that seal coat over the left up? Uh, I'm trying to think if I got that with me or not. <clears throat> I don't know, Howard, you guys have done some seal coating. It hasn't done for a while. A couple dollars a square yard. Does that sound about right? A buck fifty to two dollars a square yard, Jared? Uh, ab about that for for a seal coat. Yeah. Um, so for the thin overlay that that we've been doing lately, it's been three fifty to four dollars a square yard for that uh, uh, three quarter inch uh, thin overlay. Yeah. Um, but that one's that is more structural than uh, than your plain seal coat would be. Yeah. So, so you're looking at in the difference between a seal coat and the thin overlay is a seal coat basically is more or less just sealing the surface of the the asphalt. You know, bringing I don't know, it's, it's not a, it's not the proper term, but bringing more life back to it, putting oil back onto it, versus a thin overlay is actually putting another inch of Three quarters to an inch of material over top of it, basically smoothing out the surface, et cetera. So you're talking a dollar fifty versus three fifty. Well, and I guess my concern is even as we look at this project, we're looking to quote unquote rob our street maintenance budget so that we can pay for this project. So it appears that we don't have a very good track record of maintaining our maintenance budgets and our maintenance items. Any other questions for Dan? Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, just so that <clears throat> when we, uh, as we discuss this a little further, there are certain things we need to address here. One is, of course, whether it's asphalt or concrete. That That's one of the things that has to be decided. Um, whether or not alternative 1A, which is Grant Street, 
is included, and I'm, I'm going to refer to our last work session, it seemed to be at that time at least that council members were in favor of including alternate one. And then the suggestion has also been made now to do the uh, bike path, but that funding would come from park impact fees. So that would not increase the amount of dollars that either we are going to have to allocate from other sources within the budget or the decision also can be made to borrow and the question would be whether or not to borrow now or wait until perhaps later when the project is started I think that's possible to to do it as opposed to doing it immediately um, maybe we'll get some money into the city and won't have to borrow that would be wonderful or maybe something will come under budget and we won't have to borrow but when when we make a decision here just so the the motion whatever motion is made should include whether it's concrete or asphalt whether or not alternative uh, 1a should be included and then also whether or not it should be a borrow or some combination of the proposal that was given in our packet and then we can vote on whatever motion council decides they would like to recommend yes since I did not receive a second can I still make a motion again you certainly may make another motion I'd like to make a motion that we accept the asphalt pavement portion because of the cost factor and the financial situation of the city and we do not need to rob from our street repair department just drive around Platteville see how bad we do need repairs so your motion is only to accept the base asphalt then. the base asphalt so it does not address alternate one and it does not uh, address I can use that alternate one also included with the you could in, you could include it in your motion if you so wish and also if you wanted to include how it would be funded Mike because at some point we have to also fund this yeah and right now we with our base amount I understand that we're close to being able to fund it with our bid with the asphalt mm -hmm. now I will also include uh, alternate A as far as how we're going to fund it I don't have that information <coughs> right now so I can't talk to that well I think we're going to have to decide how we're going to fund okay, it if well, we're going to say that we are going to do this so do you want to just make your motion right now is just to do yes the asphalt yeah. and and that's your only motion yes and no alternate no 114A well, an alternate A and well, alternate A yes, as well I'm not going to be able to tell you how to fund that portion of it right now so you're making a motion to do the base bid plus alternate 114A A. alternate A which Correct. is Grant Street and alternate 114F which is the asphalt pavement with the asphalt pavement correct so those three 114F yeah, 114F 114A <coughs> and the base bid all right so we have that motion is there a second to that motion I do not hear a second to that motion. I don't either. It's unfortunate that people want to spend money we don't have. Is there another motion? Well, I would make a motion that we go with um, the base bid using concrete with alternate 1-14A and we borrow uh, the 209072 72 and 95 cents um, at a later date perhaps it will come something some other project will come in less and so you want to take money then from City Hall from sidewalk repair and from street maintenance uh, yes <coughs> with the balance being borrowed can I ask a question at this point? It, let me ask first, is there a second to that First, motion? I'll second the motion. All right, we have a second. Now, yes, discussion. A Larry, a question for you. By borrowing this extra money, how close does that put us to our maximum of money to be able to borrow? Because I know we're very close. Now, I'm going to have to refer to Dwayne or Valerie on that one. <laughs> Could one of you come up to the mic?
I don't really have a number at this time, I'd be honest. I okay. At the end of last year, I know we had a certain amount of surplus, but if you're talking about the balance of the 35% of our internal policy, is that what you're talking about right. compared to the other one? I think we were at 90-some percent at the end of last year, and then we did borrow some more this year. So um, we're almost maxed out, correct? But then we, right, we're getting close to that maxed out, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? So our motion, the motion, as I understand it, is to um, do alternate 114A, which is Grant Street, and to do the base bid with concrete, and to use the recommended um, borrowing of 209.7295 from the general, or to borrow that amount of money. Eileen, if I could, yes. clarification, was alternate D part of the motion or not? I'm sorry, was alternate D? No, it was not. Okay. It was not. Okay. It was not. Okay. And do we have a bidder that this would go to? Oh, the low bidder. The low bidder. McGuire. 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 Yeah, the lower bidder is McGuire. McGuire. <coughs> this has to be a two-thirds vote, right? It has to be a two-thirds vote, correct? So you're not doing the bike alternate 114D? You're not doing the bike path? Who's, who's doing that in the Well, that would, I don't know, I understood that that would come out of park impact fees, That's so that wouldn't be. Oh, gotcha, thank you. So it would not be part of the actual um, base bid and alternate 114A. Oh, it would have to be. I can do it if they don't have to. <coughs> don't you have to have that in your motion? If you want it done, it needs to be in the motion. Okay, so, so it does. If, okay. If that's your intent. All right. So, so I feel like I amend my. <coughs> I want to do amend. Amend uh, the motion to include. Oh, whatever motion we have, I want to include the bike path. Okay, so you would amend the a motion to include the bike path. And take it from park impact fees. Then. Yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. All right. We're going to vote on the motion first. Which I'm is sorry. Who second? Who made? Um, Stockhausen made the, the amendment, mm -hmm. and who seconded it? Steiner. Steiner. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll vote on the amendment. And so it's just the amendment vote, correct? This is just the amendment just first. Just to add Yes, the just to include the okay. bike path bike with path. the payment from park impact okay. fees. Okay. Okay. So Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Debonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right. I, now. I would like to offer an amendment. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. I really do not believe that we should be decreasing the amount of money we have for sidewalk repairs and street maintenance. So and you think so we should borrow more? I I don't think we should be decreasing the amount, and that would be twenty that that twenty thousand and fifty. So I would make a motion that the uh, general fund borrowing would be uh, increased by seventy thousand. And that taken from other CIP accounts decreased by seventy thousand, because we need to continue to do the repair. Okay, so where are you altering the numbers then, Barb? So the numbers would be altered to uh, ninety-five thousand from other CIP accounts. I guess that what's is that what that comes to? I would not take fifty from street maintenance. I would not take okay. twenty from sidewalk, sidewalk repairs. So, but you are taking the 75 from City Hall? At this point, yes. Okay. So you're removing 70,000. Right. Okay. And then I would borrow it. And you know, we may have property for sale here by the 1st of May that would just. Well, that's true. Say again, what was your last comment? We may have property for sale by the 1st of May, so we may not have to borrow. Don't count on it. Go on. So the total borrow would be two seventy nine. All right. I'm sorry. The the total would be two seventy nine. Oh seventy two point nine. Total borrow would be two seventy nine. All right. Once again, this was vote on the amendment. So the amendment again, just to clarify, is to. The amendment is to. Decrease the amount we're taking from sidewalk repair and street maintenance and add that to the amount that we would borrow. All right. And the borrow not to 
uh, occur until it's absolutely essential. I'll second that. All right, everybody understand that? Absolutely essential. All right, so we'll vote on that amendment. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right, now we have the original motion, and Jan, would you read that back, please? <laughs> With amendments. As amendments. Right. With okay. amendments, right. With amendments. So a motion by Steiner, a second by Killian, to award the base bid to the low bidder <coughs> with concrete with alternate 114A, alternate 114D to be paid out of park, park impact fees, and the 114A would be uh, borrowed, would be borrowed 279,072.95 and not using money out of no, I'm sorry. Just from, no, I, I don't understand that part. I decrease the amount from the street maintenance. Or sidewalks, I believe. 279,000, at 279,072.95 that we borrow for. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Hey. <laughs> That's our motion, and we're going to vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? No. Das? Yes. Stockhausen? No. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Oh, wait. All right. Third spot. Did there have to be a uh, two thirds vote? Yep. Five. Yeah. Five. That would be it. So it did not, it did carry. Sass. There were five only two. two no's, right? Five, two. Five, two. Five, two. Five, two. Five, two. Five, two. So it did carry, right? The two thirds vote. All right. Mm -hmm. Phew. Next item contract 214, weed and grass mowing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't want that. This is, this is uh, to allow us to enforce our tall grass ordinance. Uh, lawns cannot be over eight inches high, and, uh, and we, uh, um, if we uh, have a complaint, uh, we mail a notice to the owner that they have five days to mow the lawn, or we will mow it and bill to the customer. And so what we have is we've got uh, two parts to this contract. Uh, the first part is for what we call um, large areas. These are generally vacant parcels of an acre or more, unlandscaped areas, for example, those that are uh, 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 under, under construction, things like that. Uh, that's our base bid number one. And then we have the uh, residential type lawns, the smaller normal residential size lawns where people forget to uh, mow their lawns. What we're doing is uh, we had two bidders bid for it. Uh, the one bidder was low and the base bid rural large unlandscaped areas and the other one was lower in the isolated patches and residential lawns. Based on the fact that last year we did not have any uh, enforcement actions on those rural unlandscaped areas, we felt that it was better to go with the low bidder for the um, residential lawns, and that is Grass Pro uh, Lawn Care LLC. Uh, their base bid for bid one was 65 per hour, $75 minimum. And for the residential areas, it's $35 an hour, $39 minimum uh, for that. So recommending Grass Pro. Any questions? Otherwise, we would need a motion. I make a motion to award contract 2-14 weed and grass mowing to Grass Pro Lawn Care LLC at the bid prices of 65 an hour or $75 minimum for base bid one and $35 an hour or $39 minimum for base bid two. Second. I have a motion and a second. And we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? No. Doss? No. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? 
No. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is extended taxi service hours for 2014. Back in September, the council approved a motion to expand the hours for the shared ride taxi for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights through the end of December 2013. Uh, for those nights, the, uh, the taxi cab uh, extended until 3 a.m. the following morning. Uh, the taxi service provided data regarding the ridership, and, uh, and staff has provided that to you as well. During the budget sessions, we propose to include funding for those extended hours, um, and that budget passed. Um, what we're doing now is we're asking the council to just basically vote on a motion to, to confirm that that's what you want to do, is to extend those hours for those, those evenings. Any questions? Uh, I only have a question. That's auxiliary to this. Well, Howard, can you tell me when this contract expires? What is the term of this contract? This, this contract expires at the end of this cal calendar year. Okay, and so at that point in time, if we wanted to bid extra hours for Sunday or whatever, we could, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes. All right. I make a motion we approve the continuation of expanded hours for the shared ride taxi for 2014. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item, resolution 1410, authorizing purchase of land from James and Doris Harms. Yes. Uh, in 2014, uh, Platteville Area Economic Development Corporation negotiated the purchase of, 4 .8, of a 4.8 acre parcel from Jim and Doris Harms. Uh, this parcel is being proposed that the city uh, provide funding to purchase the parcel. Uh, the parcel will be used to extend a stormwater basin on Eastside Road. Um, so staff recommends that we approve the a motion to approve the purchase of land for $150,000 plus closing costs as previously budgeted for in TIF District Number 4, conditioned upon the vacant land offer to purchase being amended to state that the access easement on the north side of lot one terminates when Evergreen Road is constructed. And I believe that amendment was included in our packet. Is that correct, Larry? On the back page, it, it, it shows the amendment. That's correct. And it appears that the Harmses have already agreed to it, so. All right. Any questions or a motion on that? And uh, Melissa Paul, the executive director of PADIC, is here if you have any questions for PADIC. Right. If anybody has any questions, she'd be happy to answer them. But I think that that was the question that was asked last time to, to get that easement. So is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Competition for the second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Doss? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right, Legion Park Endowment Fund. Yes, I'd like to ask Luke uh, Peters to speak on this. Luke? Yes, in uh, 2011, the city of Platteville entered an agreement with uh, Platteville Youth Baseball to establish the outfield sign program at Legion Park. Um, part of that agreement included in 2014 that 50% of the proceeds from that uh, those sign advertisers went into a uh, endowment fund through the Community Foundation of Southern Wisconsin. Um, so this is the fulfillment of that agreement in establishing the uh, Legion Park Endowment Fund. Um, this uh, fund uh, basically will be used to, for repair and uh, maintenance of Legion Park baseball softball facilities and the concession stand. And uh, the change from, uh, there was an amendment um, from uh, the last update, the amount changed to reflect 50% of the current uh, amount in that trust fund. You're talking about the initial transfer then, Luke? The initial transfer, that's correct. Okay. Any questions? I do have a question. Um, let's see. On Schedule B, Luke, um, it said if the minimum is not reached, in other words, if it's not raised by December 31st, 2016, the assets of the fund shall be transferred 
to the Platteville Community Fund endowment. It wouldn't go back to the city where the original uh, binding trust fund monies are. That's correct. Well, is it binding? The uh, it has to go into a, a current fund within that account, and at that time there there wasn't the the binding endowment fund. I suppose that could be now edited to to go there. I, I don't think it's I think it's a, a moot point because we we have the money pledged to reach that ten thousand. But to be quite honest, I, I actually think it might be a good suggestion to actually flip that uh, to the binding trust. Um, when when this was written, that wasn't. Uh, Established, but uh, okay. I, I actually I would make <laughs> I would encourage you to make that amendment. Okay. Are you making an amendment? She hasn't made a motion yet. Well, is that a motion yet? <laughs> I, well, I was motion waiting to make an amendment. <laughs> as stated, though, discussion. it will be a, a moot point. We will reach that the amount, and we will have no need to transfer that money. So we could okay. you could use it as the information given, and and it could be altered later. I would yeah, think it could as be well. Altered so, later, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, a motion would be in order. Well, I will make a motion to uh, establish the City of Platteville Parks Endowment Fund through the Community Foundation of Southern Wisconsin, starting with an initial transfer of $3,600 from the Legion Park uh, Trust into the fund. As additional revenues collected from the outfield advertisements and batting cages, 50% of the proceeds will be transferred into the fund. Just one point of clarification. This is the Legion Park Endowment Fund, not the Platteville Parks Endowment Fund. Okay. I'm reading Platteville. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Das? I abstain. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. All right, next item is PCA, Platteville Community Arboretum, moving uh, Platteville Outdoors project. Uh, we have received information a couple of times on this project. However, there are people here from the Platteville Community Arboretum, so if anybody does have questions, we certainly can ask them to uh, come and speak again. Um, before we start that, yes, um, I'm a member of the PCA board, and due to a conflict of interest in talking with Brian McGraw, I feel that at this time it would be necessary that I resign from the PCA board because this isn't going to be just a one night thing. This is going to, money stuff is going to be ongoing for a while. And so therefore my term on the PCA board was just about up anyway. And I have submitted a resignation to Robin and Chris and Brian has a copy of it and Eileen has a copy of it. So that was done at 3.55 this afternoon. All right. Anyone who would like to, from the staff, speak to this, and then we can ask Somebody questions. Covered. Either way, I, I, I can do this. All right, go for it. Um, basically, we've talked about this before. The uh, PCA is looking to get a 50% grant from, from the DNR if we can uh, come up with the local match. And what they're looking for is is they're asking for three things that we sponsor and authorize the grant and uh, uh, for that grant that we approve the carryover of our original fifty thousand dollar pledge for the bridge replacement project to uh, go into this and then approve additional match funding of one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars in here i have a recommendation that the council approve a motion to do all of this and uh, we could uh, include funding partially from park impact fees uh, we could transfer money from park CIP or we could get as much or as little from uh, TIF number five to cover any or all of that hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars TIF number five is the one 
uh, with Walmart and Menards area, and under the law we can spend it on those things that uh, that support a TIF district within a half a mile, and uh, a half a mile from TIF five boundaries would come to approximately the the railroad trestle bridge out behind um, out behind uh, rural excavating. So. Uh, if we dedicate our money towards improving that section, um, you could use as much or as little of TIF 5 money for that as you want. We do have some individuals who have asked to speak, and I'm going to uh, read your name, but if, if you are just registering that you're here and are in favor of it, um, it, it's not necessary if you don't mean to speak at the same time, because some of you have done both, where you put down register in favor and speak. And some of you just put register in favor. Um, James Schneller would like to speak. Is that <coughs> <laughs> uh, Jim Schneller. And I am speaking in favor of this. And uh, uh, let me qualify it first. Obviously, this benefits me. As, uh, as, as a business owner, uh, as uh, um, shareholders in the Keystone development and the housing back there and so forth. So, you know, there, there's, there's, no, there's no secret here that this is going to benefit, uh, benefit me in one way or another. But, you know, if you talk to um, most people or many people about trails, uh, the benefits are intuitive to many of them. The National Association of Home Builders, the National Association of Realtors did a survey on the importance of community amenities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Trails came in second only to highway access in a list of 18 different categories. And to put that in perspective, um, ball fields, tennis courts, golf courses, those amenities were about one-eighth to one-sixth as important as trails. Study after study shows economic benefits, tourism benefits, social and health benefits, and, and business benefits. And I would suggest uh, you can get a lot of those studies at americantrails.org. Likewise, there's a link between good and improved trails and economic development. And a good reference there is railstotrails.org. Um, <clears throat> you know, for you folks, Sponsoring the grant, that's a good thing. I mean, that's real easy. There's, there's no cost to that. Approving the carry over, the transfer of the monies you've already done. You've already spent those monies, so the key is really the 150000 which is a lot of money. And, and uh, I, am, um, I am always one that is, promotes conservative spending on anybody's behalf. But I also look at what's the return on the investment. And in this instance, I think you, take, you need to take a look at this as, as an investment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm sure you've already heard it, but when our group of individuals went up to meet with state representatives, DNR, DOT, and so forth, they suggested not going piecemeal, but going for the entire thing. There was a much better chance of getting that money and getting it back to southwest Wisconsin. And we, have, we as in Platteville Development Group, have put our money our, where our mouth has been in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got a, a, a trail stub that we've improved. We've donated land. We've donated to the original. And I'm here to tell you tonight that we will donate another 25,000 <clears throat> 25, if the city approves this. And we would make that contingent on that, the grant, and uh, we'll do it as matching. Thank you. Um, Jim, I have one question for you. I'm sorry, I yeah, should have got you sooner. When you talk about trails, you're talking about you're talking about all trails, aren't you? Multi-use trails, all trails. Sure. When you have mm -hmm. all that information, mm -hmm. not yeah. just biking and hiking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But if you take a look at the majority of the trails and most of these studies, most of them actually are are walking and biking trails. In northern Wisconsin, it's probably the other way around. No, I'm, this is this is in this is a, a, a broader view. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. You're going to donate another twenty-five thousand. Yes. So that reduces the city park to one twenty-five. Nope. <laughs> what I'm saying is, we will do, in addition to your. If you donate, if you put in the hundred and fifty thousand, we will donate twenty-five thousand, and we'll donate it also as a matching. 
which means we should get another 25,000. So this 25,000 will hopefully generate 50. Uh, Thank you. And one other thing too, TID 5 <clears throat> has been the most successful TID in the history of the city, paying off long before. And I think that was a good investment mm -hmm. by the city. And I think this investment is a good investment as well. Thanks. All right, I would like to note that Nancy Collins has uh, not asked to speak, but she's registered in favor of the PCA um, trail effort. And we have three individuals who have indicated that they would like to speak in, well, Robin Fatsinger would like to speak in favor, and Angie Wright and Chris Wright. So if you want to come up and make a statement, now would be the time to do that. Singer, I live at 2201 County Road O in Platteville. I'm currently the president of PCA, and I'd like to take a moment just to remind you of a few key points and benefits of paving and lighting the Roundtree Branch Trail. First, the economic trail impact on real estate, which includes young families being more likely to buy lots near the trail. On retail stores, in which most more students and residents will bike to stores, theaters, restaurants, and the banks, and of course on tourism. Second, the paved trail will hook most of our businesses into that bike traffic coming in from the Belmont um, area with our new Belmont Platteville Trail. And third, as mentioned, the city has previous um, $50,000 for our three for 100K trail improvement projects with the addition of the 150,000 would mean an investment of $200,000 for an infrastructure that would actually gain us 1.2 million, which would be a six to one return on your money. Uh, lastly, our city staff, I think, has identified some uh, realistic plans for funding this effort. And thanks for your time and listening. Okay, Angie, Chris Wright and, from PCA, and then Angie, who is the uh, grant writer, will answer questions if we have any. Jack Budke is the other one that had registered to speak. I'll pass. You'll pass, all right. You're in favor? All right, council discussion on this particular um, effort, moving Platteville outdoors, and there are the um, three things that, as I understand it, would have to be included in a motion. If you look at your uh, staff note. I would like to make a motion just to bring this to the front and see what everybody here on the council thinks about it. I think it's a great idea to sponsor the authorization of this grant but I would like to see us table the dollar value at this point in time and wait and see how, what the PCA is able to come up with with all their other funding. And once they have the, all this money in place, then they can come back and then we can look at the dollar value from the city. It doesn't necessarily mean, why does the city have to be the first one to jump in with our full commitment? Let's just wait and see how they come about. <coughs> because I believe that uh, according to Gene Weber at one of the uh, meetings, he said that they, the, the DNR grant would match as much as we were able to come up with, even if it wasn't the total of $600,000. So why don't we wait and see how they come about and then we put the city money out there. We do have one other person who just, okay. I was just handed um, oh, okay. this request to have speak so, so Daryl Browning if you oh, Chris. go ahead what about Chris and Angie uh, yeah okay, Browning, 345 South Chestnut uh, I walk that trail uh, many many hours I've walked it in the morning early I have walked it late at night and I have walked it for near every Saturday and Sunday through the summer because that's where I go with my dogs. Okay, in my history of walking those trails, and I approximately walked two to two and a half hours, the most I have met on those trails is six people at a time. Most of the time it'll be a young family, couple of small kids, and then the kids up on the hill are down there riding their bicycles. The other thing is, is a year ago, Somebody went through, city, whoever, 
and took all the brush back. So that trail is now 40 feet, 50 feet wide. And it, it's very nice, very wide, less bugs. But you took all the logs out that I sit on and rest, which is it, neither here nor there. I ask you to weigh on spending this money how much use the general public of Platteville is getting out of that. Is it worth it for the five or six people? And, and, and I'm not, I'm down there many weeknights, but never during the weekdays. So please weigh that when voting. Thank you. And I, I think that Chris, did you want to get up and respond? I think um, Mike's <coughs> comment, maybe a, a further explanation of the process. So I'm Chris Wright, 910 Seymour Street, um, on the Platteville Community Arboretum Board. Your comment, uh, Mr. Den, was, or your question was, can we hold off as the city? Can we sponsor it but not allocate any dollars? It's a good question. Um, the only concern that I would have, and it's a big one, is that as the primary sponsor, your name is on the top of that grant. And so everybody else that we go to to ask for money is going to say, who's your sponsor? And we're going to say the city of Platteville. And they're going to say, how much are they investing? And we're going to say nothing. They're waiting for you. It doesn't make a very good message. Good point. But we've already donated 50000 so it's not that we've donated nothing. I, I, would, I, would, I would agree. There is $50,000 in it. But we're asking... We, what we need to generate for a $1.2 million grant is $600,000. And as the primary sponsor of that grant to get match of $60,000, you would be comfortable saying we're only giving $50,000? We're only saying that until you, your, your organization, comes back with, because you've asked a lot of things of a lot of people, but there's been a lot of talk, but there hasn't been much in the checkbook for you, okay? When you get that money, then if you came back, and then we sat down and said, okay, you have these, this money, you have all this stuff, now let the city also help. Agreed, and I, I, I do understand your point, <laughs> sir. I would point out that tonight you have a prime example of just what we're able to do. We have one group, one group, of all of our contacts that's willing to step up and offer half of how much the city has already put in. Exactly. And that's One group. Generous. And we have a lot more coming from different places. And once it gets there, you'll know for sure. You're right. But it's a chicken or the egg kind of question. Okay. How do you approach those funding sources with a sponsor who's only giving you a small fraction of the all or all dollar? It's a hard argument to make. And I, I, I do want to mention, you know, I, I acknowledge and I really appreciate the idea that maybe funding this might look like it's financially irresponsible. I, I get it. I really do. I appreciate where you're coming from. The other side of me says, though, this is a one-shot deal. This is a one-shot deal that we're going to get to invest and get a six to one return on that investment if it comes through that we're never going to get again. And if we want to do this trail again, it's going to cost a lot more for the city because we're not going to have this idea of matching and all of the support that we have right now. We're going to burn a lot of bridges if it doesn't come through. And isn't that grant due May 1st? <coughs> it is. It is due May 1st. Yep. But let me ask you, you can still write the grant without that money, right? I mean, you don't Get have to touch. have the money to write a grant? You don't need the money in hand, okay. but we need touch. commitment. You mean, okay. Thank you. We need commitment. Yes, sir. For a question. Yep. Now, as far as uh, collecting money, is there any way, what if you collect more than you anticipate? Would any of that amount be taken? Then I'd buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I'm sorry, what? that was totally inappropriate. If we get, if, if we can generate... More, would some of that come off the city portion? 
Would some of that come off the city? If we generate more than six hundred thousand dollars, you mean for the match? Well, whatever you're collecting, yeah. Would that come off of the city? I don't know if I can make that commitment at that time. Angie Wright, 910 Seamer Street, and I can address that. That's been in the presentation that Gene Weber's been giving to some various local groups. They call it Plan B. And the Plan B is that if too much money is raised, any extra money would be used to develop additional trails in Platteville and or to assist with developing PCA's 11 acres of property that the trail will run through out at Keystone Development. Question for you. Mm -hmm. Could that money also be used to pay for maintaining those trails instead of coming back to wherever it is you choose to come back to have somebody else maintain them? I would imagine it could be. I, I mean, well, I asked Gene that question about maintaining the trails, and he didn't have an answer at this time yet. Who would maintain them and pay for it? I think that still needs to be determined, but as of right now, based on the funds that were used to build that trail, I believe they're currently the city is responsible because the city was the original friends of the round tree branch built those trails friends of the round tree branch was an ad hoc committee of the city all the grant funding used to put the trails in place originally were granted to the city and so I, if, if those grants are the same as most grants the city is already responsible for maintaining those trails yet a volunteer group friends of the round tree branch and the platteville community arboretum have been managing and maintaining the trails for the past 15 years Thank you. Um, I, can I make one other quick comment? Sure. I just, this morning I was looking at your comp plan. And I guess I just wanted to make a comment so that you're aware that the comp plan update that you approved, I believe in J December or January, does have several objectives directly related to this. Under goal two in the transportation section, objective 2.1 says develop and maintain a coordinated and balanced transportation system that provides a variety of choices among transportation modes, including personal vehicle, public transit, air travel, bicycle, and pedestrian. Objective 2.3 under goal two, provide for a continuous and interconnected bicycle route and trail network that is a viable, convenient, and safe, and that will encourage both commuter and recreational cycling. Goal number three, objective 3.1, improve pedestrian connections among land uses and create a continuous and seamless pedestrian system to enhance walkability and pedestrian environment. Goal number 3.2, or objective 3.2, Strive to achieve or to assure that individuals of all ability levels have access to transportation choices that at a minimum provide access to basic life needs and that ideally allow for a healthy and active lifestyle. So those are all goals that you have that are in the comp plan that you approved. And then related to that, I also looked at the survey results that were done related or related to that comp plan update. And um, on the question, there were several questions related to trails. Um, and on one of them about um, expanding the biking and walking trail system in the city, 67% of the city residents agreed with that those trails should be expanded. Um, another question that asked about additional biking and walking trails throughout the city, 73% of city residents agreed that that should be a priority. When you uh, say percentage, you mean percentage of people that answered the survey? I do, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you have any figures as far as use? Uh, I'm sorry, Angie. Well, one more question from Councilor Kelly. Do you have any uh, information, figures as far as use of the trail in response to Mr. Brownie's comment? We don't have any figures right now about use. Um, I have been talking with PCA about starting to become involved in something called the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project, which has a, a coordinated methodology for doing these counts, and it has three set days every year that people throughout the country do counts. And we've talked to them, the next count is May 8th and 9th, I believe, and we are probably going to try to participate in that. I've also been looking at, a, for the grant applications I've been doing, I've had to do comparability kind of stuff, and I've looked at many similar trails. In um, the, the main ones that I've been looking at because I've been trying to get the most simula similarity are trails in Sheboygan County, Wisconsin, Janesville, Wisconsin, and then there are three trails out on the East Coast in Vermont and Massachusetts that are located in communities with similar population bases to ours. And the average user counts on those trails, th that's looking at five different trails, was 860 users a day on the weekdays and 1,200 users a day on the weekends. 
Are there any comparisons as far as between the gravel versus paved? So the idea is sort of that field of dreams. If we build it, they'll come. Well, that's true. And I don't, I don't have any that I can you know, spew out to you. But I know that some of those websites that uh, Mr. Schneller was mentioning do look at those. And I know that the studies have shown that the, the higher the amenity quality, such as paving and lighting, the higher the use levels the trails get. Um, and I will say that Sheboygan County only put their trails in recently, within the last five years. They saw a 43% increase in walking and biking in one year alone after they put the trails in. It, sure, as long as you were registered to speak. Yep. <laughs> and then we will move on to some kind of a motion here because we have people waiting to talk to us. I, I'll, I'm ready to offer okay, a motion. Okay, we have just one more quick okay. comment. Just, just three, three. <laughs> Three quick things. One on use, I, I suggest it probably is lower than it will be. This is a good investment. If you invest it and you build it better, they'll get used more. Plus, you're going to have the, the link to <coughs> Belmont. Uh, as far, uh, Mr. Dunn, as your, your comment is, why is so little monies right now? This whole, this whole effort transpired in an extremely short time. And so uh, there's the businesses, there's the city. Uh, the UW, all of those entities are being talked to concurrently right now. And why, why make the commitment prior to? There's a much higher probability of getting the grant if support is already shown. Thanks. Quick question for you. When you say university, you're talking about university foundation, not uni university. We've, uh, uh, they've, they've approached, and where, where that comes from and how, I, I don't know yet. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, no one, right now, it's, it's a multi-pronged, parallel attack, if you will, to try to try to get as much support and commitment as we can, or as PCA can, for when this grant gets submitted. We've got a one shot here in a very short time frame. It's at a potential of $600,000 coming back to Southwest Wisconsin. And I think it's a great idea. Trails yeah. are phenomenal. I was just wondering why we maybe couldn't wait to see what all transpired before we brought our money in. I understand. You know, worst comes to worst, make the commitment contingent on Pro rata money's being raised on the rest of the request. For, or, but, but, the, but even to show that commitment, we're going to have a much higher probability of, or I'm sorry, they will have a much higher probability of that grant being awarded. Even once a grant is awarded, it isn't an absolute that it has to go through. Right. But we, 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 we lose the ability to go through that door. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. And Mike. Your comment was you had made a motion and then Mr. Browning asked to speak. So could we... you didn't ask for a second. Okay. And would you make the motion again then, please? Okay. I'll make a motion that, where's my paperwork here, that we sponsor the author, the, an authorization for the grant, but that we table the money until the PCA can show us their money that they've got and, and how, it's, how much they've got and where they're ready to go so then we can then bring it back or talk to it in the city and bring up the city money instead of being the first ones to jump out with the whole whole amount of money. Okay, so we have your motion. Is there a second to the motion? All right, I see no second. Okay, so okay, thank is you. there another motion? I make a motion we accept the staff recommendation that we sponsor an authorized submission of this grant to DNR that we uh, authorize carryover of the original $50,000 that we uh, pledged last year for the 3 by 100 project and that we approve a pledge of $150,000 in additional local support uh, with the funding to come from park impact fees, the park CIP, and TIV 5. I second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. So as far as coming up with the Monday money, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be at the time of CIP. Did I read that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Park, park impact CIP. fees, right. park CIP, right. and TIF five. Right. It's as was outlined in the staff recommendation. So what if the council at that time decides we can't mm -hmm. give it all? Well, any future council can overturn whatever we do. So we're just going to vote on the motion that we have. This is all in the 2014 budget, so it wouldn't have to be considered again. And Brian? Um, staff's conferring on a question oh. that they may have. Okay. okay. Is there a question for us? This year? It's fine. Yeah, it's clarification is this year's. 
this year's money. Say it over. What are you saying? Uh, um, Dwayne just had a question whether that was going to be this year's money, and I, my original intent in in the staff note was that it would be 2014 money. What happens if it's 15? We'll have to look at it again. Mm, yeah. What What Carry happens? In 2014, the staff note is set up for 2014 funds, i.e., a budget amendment requiring two thirds vote. If you want to do it in 2015, we will not be able to provide the funding to the PCA in time for their grant application. And then when it comes to the budget time in the fall, it is entirely possible that whoever's on the council at that time may not fulfill that obligation. Oh boy. So mine was for as recommended 2014 and that's okay. your second i still second that motion so that's a quick question Ellie. Yeah. this by doing it this way there's not actual taxpayer dollars involved in this is there yes there is yep there, is. there would be under which portion 25. The, it would be from the park cip correct right that's correct it's 25 000. okay that is tax, but the rest of it's not the right. 125 is not okay thank you all right we'll vote nichols yes Steiner? Yes. Den? Yes. Das? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion All carried. Right. We have one information and discussion item. It's the binding trust donation to EMS. We have a <coughs> information in our packet from Brian Allen, the EMS administrator. So Brian, did you want to say anything to sort of lead into this? Otherwise, people, if you have questions. <coughs> Um, I can just briefly go over it. It's the auto pulse is a mechanical CPR device. Um, it allows for safer transport and consistent um, compressions of a person in cardiac arrest um, with a better outcome. And the request would be to use 31,000, I think it was. 37. Uh, $31,046.99. From the binding trust. In, uh, I, I would just make one comment, and that is when we've, uh, it, it, these monies that we have that have been put in trust to us, I, I recall very vividly, and I think Patrice can uh, uh, corroborate this, is that um, in expenditures of other natures, we've required a match of 50% before we allowed any expenditure, and I, I really believe that that's, I mean, I think we did that all the time with the theater group, and I think it would be uh, that that's a practice that we've kind of established. So that's what I would look to. Um, I have a question for you, Brian, real quick. Um, on your, I think it was your department head report, you said you had submitted a grant to the Dubuque Racing Association. Correct. What? That was for Project Pulse. That's for Project Pulse. Okay. <laughs> Do you think there would be any other grants out there like that that could pay for one of these and therefore get a 50% match? I would have to do more research. I'm not sure what would be available okay. for you know, that. I understand the, you know, how important it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's making it safe not just for uh, the patient, uh, but also, you pointed out the um, the EMTs makes it safer for them, you know, while they're in the back of of the ambulances. Um, it's just like Barb was saying, you know, this is trust money, and you know, we just the city does not get money, you know, willed to them very often. And um, so, when I first heard about the monies and that the binding trust was giving roughly $44,000 to about five different groups in the city. My feeling was, you know, to save and to invest it. Um, so right now, I'm really on the fence. <laughs> I understand, you know, the importance of this equipment, but at the same time, I'm still also struggling or thinking that really the money should be saved and invested too. So I'm not sure, unless somebody else can convince me otherwise. <laughs> Brian, I've been a uh, first responder for over 30 years, so I'm very familiar with the importance of this sort of thing. And by reading the, the information that you gave us and everything else, I think it was a very good expenditure, and I think 
when it comes to that time, I'll do my best to see that we get that. What we've done in the past is what we've done in the past. Doesn't mean that's what we have to do in the future. You save one life. Do you folks put a price tag on any of that? Thank you. Um, Brian, in reading it over, I, I noticed that you had mentioned quite a few communities that have this equipment, they're using it now. And so I guess I would echo what was said earlier, which is it would be nice to know if they did receive grants to, to receive some I, of those. I know Fenimore, um, they had, I believe, purchased one and received a small grant to help with the cost. But after they had used it on, they'd used it multiple different times, but after the first time, they decided that it was something that they needed to purchase for both of their ambulances. So they went ahead and they spent the money to purchase it. From their general fund or did they? From their, from their own funds. Um, Dodgeville and Mineral Point, <coughs> theirs was purchased by the hospital, um, by Upland Hills. But that is because Dodgeville and Mineral Point were an advanced level provider um, when these were purchased more than five years ago. And the agreement was that um, any ambulance service coming into Upland Hills, if there was not, if the ambulance service did not have this device, that Dodgeville or Mineral Point had to respond and meet them alongside the road with this device and bring them bring that patient in with it. So Brian, they were doing how many do we have in the city of Platteville, and where are they? Okay. This is for the auto pulse for the. Yeah, I know. How many do we have now in the city of Platteville, and where are they? For the auto pulse, there are none. There are none. Okay, well, folks will have to. We have. We do not have this equipment in the ambulances. We have the AEDs, the automatic external, external defibrillators. defibrillators. Um, there are six of those, I think, the AEDs, if you're thinking about those, which is different than, than oh, okay. the uh, item on the ambulance. So, Is there a limitation on what we need to use this money for? The Biney Trust money, do we have a problem? It was, from what I read in the will, it was willed to, it wasn't willed to Platteville EMS, it was willed to the ambulance provider for the city of Platteville, is how all the documentation I saw. There from, really were no details to. How it was spent? Yeah, uh, uh, for any department, you know. Um, One so, more question, um, the, the CIP for this year, I, uh, I should have looked it up, but does EMS have anything in the no. CIP for 2014? What about 2015? Uh, as it was proposed, I believe there is another ambulance, but unless there is a facility, there's supposed to be a third ambulance. Uh, I think it's a good idea. What do you plan to do with the other 13,000? That would be the council's endowment i'm not sure what's been done with the other funding because i haven't been able to be at the meeting so all right well any other questions otherwise we are going to complete well, the televised portion and we'll go into a work session where we will start with the library block update and after that have a uw platteville update and then go into closed session do you need them? Is there any guidance on what you want on the EMS uh, staff note for next time? Is this something you want to pursue as, <clears throat> I mean, I can we get some direction? If Brian can get us additional information on other funding sources, that might be helpful. Um, I think that, that would be the one question. I know that there are some other accounts, um, EMS accounts, like Act 102 and um, sponsor or donations or something, supplies, and I know there's money in there, and so could that money be used for these? Um, this equipment as opposed to the binding um, trust, I guess I would be interested. And, and I guess I also, since uh, I, I'm assuming that we would only pay 75% of the cost, that 25% of the cost would be allocated to the um, other ambulance um, entities, our, township. Our other and ambulance entities, the townships and... That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. So that would be another question to ask. Okay, do we need a motion to go into closed session after our work session at this point? Can I ask one more question? Oh, sure you can, go ahead. Can some of this 13,000 be used for maintenance of this equipment? I'm just you asking You can use it for whatever you like. Yeah. Well, yeah. put that in your discussion. Um, 
you can go right to the work session and make a motion from the work session, or you could do it now. Let's make it from the work session. All right. Thank you very much, folks.